Perfect. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Who Cares for the Caregiver? My name is Jackie Zimmerman. I'm the Public Education Associate at Mental Health America's National Office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I have a few notes for you all before I introduce a wonderful speaker. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within one week. If you would like to request a certificate of attendance, I'll have a link that you can fill out to request that. I'll post it in the chat here shortly, and that will also be included in those follow-up materials. We will have some time at the end for some Q&A with our speaker, so please feel free to add any questions in the chat throughout today's session. I'll be collecting those, and then we'll go through a few of those at the end as time allows. So thank you in advance for your thoughts and questions. And as always, we encourage you to use the chat to connect with others, um, make comments, share knowledge, share resources. Um, so please feel free to utilize that throughout today's session. I want to recognize that this month is National Family Caregivers Month. And um, that is really what our, our topic is going to focus on today is how do we make sure that we're caring for all of those who are caregivers? And if you're a caregiver yourself, how are you taking care of your mental and physical health? As we know, it is an exhausting and um, draining job and role that many, many take on. And so just recognizing that, that it's National Family Caregivers Month, MHA has also put out some resources this month that I'll also post in the chat here shortly and include in the follow-up materials that is a online guide for new caregivers. So if this is a role that you recently had to take on and you're needing some extra support and resources, that guide kind of talks through the basics for our new caregivers and provides some support and information. And now I am very excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Armstead, who is a self-proclaimed lifelong learner. She has earned a degree, a bachelor's degree in business management and a master's degree in human resources management and a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology. But while she loves to learn, she also has a passion for teaching. And with that, Dr. Armstead has over 15 years of experience training various levels of professionals in global organizations. She's held professional roles at Ford Motor Credit Company, Macy's, and currently Nissan. Dr. Armstead founded Balancing the Life, an online community dedicated to highlighting the importance of work-life balance for overall well-being. Similarly, in understanding the need for real dialogue around the topic of mental health, she's the host of Mental Health Makeover, a YouTube channel dedicated to providing practical tips to empower others to be proactive about their mental health. Welcome, Dr. Armstead. We are so happy to have you here with us today and I'm excited for this next hour of learning with you. So I will let you take it over from here. Thank you, Jackie, and welcome to everyone who intentionally set aside some time to join us for this session. So that was a mouthful, um, but thank you, Jackie, for that intro. And it's so great to um, see or read all the folks joining in from everywhere. So I saw a lot of Arizona and California, uh, a little jealous because those are warm spots. I'm in Michigan. And although there's no snow yet, we are not, uh, we're starting to get actually a little bit cooler uh, coming up this weekend. So I'll try not to take my jealousy out on all you folks who are from these warm climates. Um, so let's see, as we get started today, again, I'm very excited to be here and just share with you some awesome things. Um, a very special thank you to Mental Health America for facilitating these valuable webinars, just to keep us informed and in community with one another. So while blogs are good, online articles and tools online are really great, these live webinars are my favorite because they allow us an opportunity to experience topics together, but also learn from one another. So I'm gonna encourage you even at the, the onset here to participate fully. There'll be a few opportunities for you guys to join in on chats and some other things. So be willing to share because that is what truly makes these sessions so impactful. Now our topic today, who cares for the caregiver? I want you to ponder that question as we embark upon our time together, but I promise you 
by the end, I'll make sure you leave here with a clear answer. Okay, so we'll all be on the same page. With that, let's go ahead and jump right in. So the best place to start here is at the core and make sure we're all aligned on the true essence of caregiving. So caregiving comes in a variety of forms, as we all know, but it is essentially the act of providing care for another person. So we can think about the many professions um, that are provided for caring, uh, that are dedicated to caring for others. So we think about doctors and nurses, counselors, therapists. Um, there are seasons in life when individuals may take on the job of caregiving, maybe when they become moms or dads. Also, parents of special needs children may have the unique role of being a lifelong caregiver, right? Then there are those adults who provide care for their aging parents and other family members um, that are in need. All of these are extremely important roles. But for today, we're gonna focus most on the role of family caregivers. So as Jackie said, November is officially National Family Caregivers Month. Now, you might feel a little bit like me in that lately it seems to be a day or month for everything, right? Anything you can think of, there's some kind of special day set aside. So did you know that um, there was a national pizza day? Actually, it's held in February. Now, I'm a big fan of pizza, so that one doesn't bother me as much. But there's also a national soup month that's held in January, and then a national cell phone courtesy month in July. I don't even know what that is. But even though there's so many things that we can celebrate, I happen to think November is a great month because it gives us this, this unique opportunity to really uh, publicly celebrate those who selflessly give so much in being a caregiver, okay? Um, and so I do wanna share a little bit of information about what we know so far about caregivers in the US. So over half um, are women. So more women are caregivers or take on that role. Not to say that men don't, but the majority are women. We know that most caregivers work outside the home. So either in a part-time or full-time capacity in addition to their caregiving role. Also, as we talk about caregivers, many are over the age of 50. And so that means they may also be facing their own health concerns and navigating those as well. And this one was kind of a shocker for me, but according to our report, it says that uh, over a million American young people aged eight to 18 actually care for an adult relative on a daily basis. So that one is kind of a big, a big wow for me. Here's something else you may not know, according to our US 2020 report on caregiving. 53 million Americans take on the role of caregiver each year, 53 million. So as we embark upon our time together today, I'll talk to you guys who are caregivers, but I also want to speak to those who maybe currently you're not a caregiver or you haven't had the opportunity to be. What some of these statistics mean is that at some point in your life, you may have the opportunity to become a caregiver. So I invite you to pay full attention to our time today because there's some really good tips that you'll be able to glean from our discussion today. All right, so as we get started, I wanna get a feel for who's joined today. So I know where a lot of you guys are from, so thank you for adding that to the chat. But I do wanna know what's your relationship currently to caregiving? Now, mainly I'm a little bit nosy, but mostly um, it's gonna help us drive our discussion today to kind of see who we have in the room in regards to um, your caregiving relationship. So here's what I wanna know, and I'm gonna have Jackie go ahead and pop up the poll for us. And the question for today is, who do you care for? So I want you to take a look at the poll that'll be popping up shortly and just select the best answer that describes your current status of caregiving in this current season of life. So I'll give you a few seconds to read through them all and get your votes in. No, that's a pretty long list here. All right, couple more seconds to make sure everyone has a chance to get their vote counted. We still have quite a few coming in, so we'll give it just a little bit of time here. Awesome, thank you, Jackie. Mm -hmm. 
And Jackie, I'll let you call it. When it looks like our responses, the majority are in, I'll let you call it. Perfect. It's slowing down a little, so I'll give everyone just a few more seconds to select that poll option and then we'll close it here. I love to hear that results are coming in. So people are joining in. Yes, we have quite a few. All right, I'm gonna end it so we can share the results. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jackie. So it looks like a combination of two or more of the above at 27% gets it, right? Um, and I'm not surprised because a lot of us could have uh, multiple roles, right? So you might have a single dad that's raising their young child, but also caring for their, their uh, elderly mom, right? And so we see this a lot. For the few of you, we had less than 10% that says uh, none of the above. So again, I'll encourage you to still pay attention because you may be able to use some of these resources in the future or share them with someone who you know may be going through uh, or having a caregiving situation currently. So thank you guys for participating. It gives me some basis on, on what we're looking at today. So thank you. Now I do wanna talk about kind of our four main goals that we will uh, utilize towards um, for the rest of our session. So my goal is to help you create a mental shift in your view of caregiving. You're gonna learn how or what it means to create space to care. Together, we're gonna to examine some practical ways that you can create space to care. And then finally, you're gonna leave here, I promise, equipped to support those who give care. So now that we're all aligned with the goals for the day, let's go ahead and jump into it here. So the fact is, unfortunately, there are some alarming truths about caregiving that we must cover. There is a purpose to starting with some of the negatives, so just hang in here with me. So 70%, uh, nearly 70% of caregivers report they don't see their doctor regularly because of their caregiving responsibilities. And so they say that it's difficult to find and practice self-care. We also know from our report that one in four uh, say that they have diminished family relationships because they care for a, a loved one. So we know that in some times relationships may suffer in some of these caregiving capacities. And then about 24% are caring for more than one person as you guys just confirmed in our poll, right? And so that means you kind of have a double whammy or more on you by actually caring for more than one person at a time. Research also tells us that caregiving can take a significant emotional, physical, and also financial toll on those who are providing care. So caregivers out there, and there are plenty of you according to our poll, I know some of these stats are jarring, right? But my intention was not to freak you out, so hopefully you're not ready to run out of the session, but I really wanted to clearly bring to your attention how important this issue is to your own health. You really can't afford not to pay attention during the rest of the session because I'm gonna give you practical ways that you can ensure you do not become one of these statistics. Now, you might say, Dr. Armstead, it's too late. I'm already burned out, my own health is suffering. I am gonna encourage you um, that what I'll share today will help to pull you out of that and continue to get you on more of a healthy path. That means that you can give more to the one that you care for. Now, non-caregivers, and there are about 9% of you guys on our call today, these data points should matter to all of us, including you guys, because they're not just numbers. These numbers include our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members. So to ensure these staggering statistics are reduced, you will be equipped to support the, care, support the caregiver's care as well. So hang in there with me. All right, so the one thing I wanna make sure you remember today is the term create space. You'll remember it because I'll mention it a few times, a lot of times, so that it's embedded in your brain. Um, I promise you might get tired of hearing it, but this is vitally important. So I don't want you to miss out on this, right? So SPACE, as is listed here, is actually an acronym. And it stands for Seeking Peace Amid Challenging Environments. So I would venture to guess that 100% of you would probably agree with me that being a caregiver can be challenging at times. 
Some days you may find yourself trying to stay afloat, just trying to make it, just trying to get through the day. Um, some days it could seem so dark and literally feel like you're caught in a storm with no way to see the sun. So I happen to know this firsthand um, because of experience I've had probably close to 10 years ago now. So my husband was actually di diagnosed with a type of cancer uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and during that time, we had a two-year-old and a six-year-old. So you already know, busy life with that. I was in school full-time pursuing my terminal degree. Plus, I had an elderly great aunt that myself and my extended family helped to care for. So with all this stuff going on, um, I actually became the, the primary caregiver for my husband during this time as well. Um, thankfully, uh, thank, thank God that after all these years, I'm happy to report that my husband is cancer free today. He's healthy and strong, but honestly, talk about some challenging, overwhelming times, right? Um, I've been there and so I, I definitely know the feeling. What I learned is this concept of creating space through my own challenging season of being a caregiver. And I'm really happy, <clears throat> excuse me, happy to share that with you today. So let's talk more about creating space so you get the feel for it as we go through. So it is really having this mentality of freedom, knowing that you do have the power to control the space or environment around you. It's realizing and focusing on what's in your control instead of being stressed and overwhelmed about what you cannot control. I'm going to warn you, this is going to require a mindset shift, okay? So what you're used to thinking about or have grown up thinking about around caregiving or how you currently practice caregiving may change. So I encourage you to keep an open mind as we talk through how do you create space. So I love practical, easy to follow things. So we're gonna talk about four ways that you can create space to be a more successful caregiver. And so we'll walk through each of these to show you how you can do that. What you can do is that you can create space for self-care, that's our first way. You can create space for joy. You can create space for help, one of my favorites, and then also creating space for reflection. So let's talk about each of these in just a little bit more detail. All right, I like to start at the top here. And I agree with the saying that says, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think this one says it all. You can't pour from an empty cup. So take care of yourself first. The very first way to create space to be a successful caregiver is to create space for self-care. You cannot pour from an empty cup. So I want you to think about that for a moment, right? Because it sounds so easy. If you come to the rescue of someone who has been stranded in the desert and they are literally dying of thirst and you show up and you have this huge, big gulp sized cup, but it's empty, you can't help them. How can you give someone what you don't have? So I know that this whole concept of self-care kind of seems like one of these trending topics that you know people are hashtagging and you see all the blog posts about and everything on social media. But I can tell you that this concept has been around forever. Um, and let me tell you that it is vitally important um, to our own care, especially as caregivers. So even when the hashtag stop and people, you know, the, the social media influencers stop talking about it. This is still your best bet um, to ensure your, your own health care is intact. So I want to show you that there are three actions you can take to make it happen, right? We want to make this easy, applicable, and practical. Here's the very first way. You want to be intentional about your self-care. That means you plan it, you schedule it, you talk about it, you ask for it, right? So you let others know it's important to you, and therefore, They'll respect your time so that you can have self-care. Here's the next one. And this, again, requires a huge mindset shift. Remind yourself that self-care is not selfish. Um, you know, oftentimes when we take care of ourselves or take time for ourselves, we may feel guilty about it. Um, but I love to use the ox oxygen example here. So think about the last time you've flown on an airplane, right? Going to visit family or friends or hopefully a, a really cool vacation. And you get on and the stewardess starts to give their spiel and talk about safety. And in an emergency, they say, 
if an emergency happens to put on your own oxygen mask before you assist anyone else, right? So this whole idea that it's not selfish, but vital is that you want to make sure to take care of yourself because that allows you to help better take care of others. Here's the last way you can create space for self-care and it's simple. Don't overthink it. It does not have to be some elaborate, glamorous trip to Hawaii every time you want to do self-care, right? You can do something small for yourself. Um, it may be something weird to everyone else, but as long as it soothes you or makes you smile or puts you at ease, it is perfect for your own self-care. So here's one of my favorite things to do in, in group settings. Um, I love to hear from you all. What do you currently do for self-care? And remember, nothing's too big or too small or too ridiculous, so don't feel afraid to share. But I'll just ask you to put in chat, what do you currently do for self-care? And it may give some other people some ideas on what they can do to better care for themselves. Donna, I love karaoke. I'm not a great singer, so I don't do it often, but I love that. Yoga and meditation. I start my morning every day with that. So I'm definitely on board with that. Rebecca, I saw you concerts. Awesome. I hear a lot of listening to music as well, watching movies. All right, Kelsey, it sounds like one of my kids are on, the, on here, video games. I know a lot of people that love video games or games on your phone, so that's awesome. Deborah, massage. Oh, I think that's number one on my list. I don't do them often, but oh, it's such a treat when I do. Exercise, naps, all those fun things. I love that, I love that. Thank you guys for sharing and so much more are coming in. I love this. I actually had someone say to me in a session, what? what should I do for self-care? Like, what, what is that? And I'm like, let me have some people help you out. So I love all these great examples that you guys have, gave, have given um, to show that we can do it. So sharing the activities you provide and the energy that you give towards yourself can provide other people with great ideas on how they can care for themselves. Plus, it proves that we can make time for ourselves and the world not stop, right? Getting rid of that guilt, right? All right, thank you guys for adding to that. I wanna go into our second way to create space to be a successful caregiver, and that is create space for joy. Now, remember we said this will take a mental shift on your part, right? So although you are frustrated, tired, and the person you're caring for is in a terrible mood today because maybe they just came back from dialysis for the last three hours, you might still be able to find something to be happy about. Caregivers, you may spend a lot of time picking up medications for the one you're caring for, but don't ever forget that laughter is truly one of the best medicines. So let me tell you how you can actually do this, how you can create space for joy. Recognize and realize. So recognize the moment you're in and realize that you can change it, okay? Mindset shift. So here's what I mean. Have you ever been in an argument with someone and, you know, as you're going back and forth with your heated exchange and they fumble their words? So as they're trying to tell you off, you know, they just mess up their entire sentence. And in your anger, you try your best not to explode with laughter because you're too mad, right? But you just can't help it. And before you know it, both of you are kind of rolling around on the floor in laughter because it was just that funny. So at that moment, it lightens the atmosphere. It changes things, right? So in that example, you recognize, yes, you were in a heated debate, but you realize you had the power to switch up the heavy situation with laughter. That is actually choosing joy. Here's another one that's pretty easy. Find something to be joyful about. So there is a ton of research out there that talks about this linkage between choosing to be positive and joyful, um, and the associated health benefits that, that come along with that. So, you know, for example, research from John Hopkins Medical School found that 70% of disease is psychosomatic, right? So that means it first originates in the mind, the psyche, and then it can start to affect the body or the soma. 
Um, and that is what helps to prove this mind-body connection that for years, people just kind of didn't believe in until science started to catch up. So that just lets us know that choosing to be happy, even in a challenging situation, um, can help control your mental space and can positively impact your physical health. And it's not just joy that lightens the moment. Joy coupled with laughter actually changes your physiology. So it can activate your stress response, it improves your immune system and can stimulate many organs positively. Now that makes shoes and joy worth it. And we talk about find something to be joyful about. You know, maybe in a bad situation, you go back, you know, in your memory bank and think about something that, that you can share that was embarrassing for you or something similar to the situation. Or think about a time you both can remember that was, you know, extremely funny. If nothing else, try to find the positive in the day, right? So, you know, if um, it might suck that you get a flat tire on your way to the doctor's appointment, but you can say, well, I'm thankful that it's a sunny and warm day today and not stormy and wet like it was yesterday. That again is choosing joy. Alrighty, here's our third one. And this is all around reading the room. So you usually get to know or already know the person you're caring for very well. So uh, you know if it's an appropriate or inappropriate time to crack a joke or lighten the moment, right? So in other words, you have to choose your moments wisely. So I am grateful to say that my mom is a breast cancer survivor. Uh, years ago, actually, my oldest son is 16, so approximately 16 years ago um, when he was first born, she was diagnosed um, and we started on the journey to battle her disease. The hardest thing for her was losing her hair. So that subject was off limits. She would talk about her treatments and how she felt and everything else, but talking about her hair was off limits. What ended up happening over time, you know, she had, after she had lost every single shred of hair on her head and had gotten used to wearing wigs and actually started liking it a little bit too much. Um, she was the first one to joke about her head looking like a light skin raisinette. Now, I don't know if you guys know what raisinettes are, but they're one of my favorite candies, but that cracked me up. And so before I knew it, we both fell over on the floor laughing together. And I even added my own jokes about what her, um, her bald head looked like, right? The point I'm making is, we had to pick that time, right? There was a time where bringing up her hair was not laughable and would not have been funny. But because we picked the right time, we were able to then have that moment, ease the tension, right? And even have some really um, in-depth conversations about her cancer overall. It was timing and we definitely had to wait for the moment. So now I know we've already talked about how frustrating at times and overwhelming caregiving can be. So let's be very clear. I want to make this very clear. Every day will not be a fun fest when you are a caregiver, right? Um, and we recognize that. Everything won't be something to laugh about or have fun about. There will be some hard days. But when you can, choose to be joyful. Choose something to lighten the load um, and, and give you guys a break there. It can be helpful for your own mental health because sometimes you just have to laugh or you need to smile. And you need to give yourself permission to find some joy, even if it's in the smallest ways. Uh, as we mentioned, it can lighten the load for you and also release some stress for the person that you're caring for. So hopefully that gives some insight on creating space for joy. All right, the third one, create space for help. We're gonna spend some time here because this is one of the, my favorites because I think it deserves the most attention. Oftentimes we can be stubborn care, caregivers and we don't wanna ask for help, okay? I'll raise my hand first so you don't have to. Um, you know, we might feel like we can handle it all no matter how overwhelming it becomes or we may feel like we just don't wanna bother other people with our troubles. Does that sound kind of familiar care, caregivers? Um, so I, I, I feel you because I was there and I, I, I also felt that same way. But someone gave a really good friend of mine some great advice when she was supporting her sister um, through a cancer diagnosis. And she was told, do not deny anybody else, other people, their chance to be a blessing. So think about it. When you're going through a hard time and people who love you are watching, they want so badly to help, but they may not know what to do. Give them that chance to feel needed. 
it not only helps you, but it will make them feel like they've done something to support you in your time of need. So it can be, you know, a blessing for both of you. So here is the question, caregivers. Do you need help? Let me help you with the answer. Yes, you do. <laughs> Whether you want to admit it or not, sometimes we all need a little bit of help. So I want to do another quick poll to find out how good you are at asking for help. So I remind you, your answers are anonymous, so feel free to be honest. But Jackie, I'm going to have you pull up our next poll. And if everyone can just choose how comfortable you are with asking for help. Let's see where we are on this. We'll give you about a minute or so. Still see answers coming in, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds here. This one's a little easier. You have less options, but <laughs> it might be harder to think about. <laughs> Far less options, so that's always good. All right. It looks like it's slowing down, so I'm going to end it and share our results here. I'm impressed. All right. So whopping 59%, more than half says somewhat comfortable and only when they really need help. Well, that is so much better than not asking for it at all. Um, we're going to those 27% that says not comfortable at all. don't want to bother anyone. I want you to listen to our, our next few steps here. Um, and kudos to the 14% that says they are very comfortable because they realize already they can't do this alone. So thank you guys. Thanks so much for being honest. Here is how you change your mindset to learn to ask for help. Um, and I thank you guys for being so honest on that poll. Here's the first way. We all need to release the super mentality. So in this age of Batman and Aquaman and Black Panther and Wonder Woman and all of the Avengers, it's easy to get caught up here, right? But remember, superheroes are only for the movies and comics books. So we want to stop pretending to be Superman and Superwoman. It is actually counterproductive to your mental and physical health if you're overwhelmed and stressed out, right? So this is why we need to hear that. It can impact a multitude of things, but you know, let's start with the quality of your sleep. It can diminish your focus and increase mood swings. It can also cause digestive problems and poor mental health. So I am asking you caregivers, realize your limitations as a human because we all need help sometimes, okay? Here's the next way you can do this, assess areas of needed support. So that just means you need to identify early the areas where you need the most help. So if someone asks, hey, what can I do to help you out? What can I do to lighten your load right now? You can really be specific in your ask. So, you know, let's say a friend offers to take the person you care for to their monthly doctor's appointment. Um, and, you know, you, you're like, well, you know, I actually like the monthly appointments because it gives me a chance to get out and, you know, get some fresh air. So maybe then you ask them instead, could they cook a meal, right? And so being aware of where you need support and where you need help um, will help you when other people are offering. Um, and you can make sure that you're getting the help that you need. Here's the last one, and it is create your support circle. This means you want to identify and call on those who you can who can support you. So I recall um, back when I mentioned my husband went through his cancer diagnosis, and right after we left the oncologist, we realized that we were in for a possibly a multi-year battle, right, with cancer. So the first thing we did was called on our support network. We invited all of our family and very very close friends over for a big family meeting, right? Um, of course, we had food because feeding people always puts them in a, an agreeable mood. Um, so if you're going to do this, always have a little bit of good food for them. Um, but what we did is just got everybody together, explained the situation and explained that we would need help, right? We weren't too proud to ask for it. We knew that it was a lot more than we thought we could handle at the time. So we asked for help. 
thankfully, you know, by the time the meeting was over, we had people signing up to cook meals and to pick up my kids from school and to come over and cut the grass. It was it was a blessing for us. Um, and so we cannot be afraid to ask for help uh, when we do need it. I will mention, though, knowing that you have this network of support is helpful and it allows you and the one you're caring for to have hope and comfort even during those difficult times. I do realize, however, that you know my story may be an anomaly. Maybe you don't have a huge family or a really close network of friends, right? That you can call upon. So I will share later some other resources that you can utilize so that you can build your own circle of support, right? So regardless if it's family, friends, or another organization or association, there is support out there. You just have to ask for the help that you need, okay? So the fourth and final way that you can create space in order to be a successful caregiver is by creating space for reflection. So this is the final item purposely as it is what we should do all the time. So whether it's at the end of the day, the end of a work week, the end of a month or the end of the year, we wanna take time to reflect. And this is simply an assessment concept that allows you to think about what you've done. Here is how easy it is to take time to reflect. Pause and set aside time. Make sure this happens during a time where you have the least amount of interruptions so you can really slow down and truly focus. So for me, it's the end of the night when my family is sleeping or occupied doing their own things, right? For some, it may be early in the morning before the whole house wakes up or before their nosy neighbor gets outside cutting grass and doing all kinds of things. Parents of little ones, maybe your best time to reflect is when your baby is napping at two in the afternoon. Find the time that works for you. The important piece here is to find the time. Now, a really valuable tool to use to facilitate your reflection time is a journal. Um, and, and it's one of my favorite practices. And it really is simply the process of getting things off your mind, because sometimes our thoughts can run crazy. We get them off our minds and onto paper or a tablet or cell phone, whatever you decide to use. But journaling has plenty of, of health benefits, um, and it does a lot to improve your, your mood, your blood pressure. There are tons of research around there on that that I can go on and on with forever. But from a psychological standpoint, um, we know that writing about stressful experiences or chaotic uh, situations can help you to manage them in a very healthy way. So journaling is a great way to pause and set aside time. Here's the next thing, and it's simple. Ask yourself some questions, right? So too often we don't self-assess. So caregivers, especially, we might be so concerned with the ones that we're caring for that we completely forget about ourselves but you need to set aside some time to ask yourself some questions. Have you allowed sufficient time for your self-care? How is your own health? When was the last time you laughed? Or the person you care for, when was the last time they laughed? Who can you ask for help? Because you know you need some help sometimes, right? All of these are questions that we need to start to consider and ponder. And it's a great place to record them in your journal, both the questions and the answers. So you can always go back and refer to them. Here's the last way that you can create space for reflection. And it is celebrate your successes. Caregivers, think about all that you do for the ones you care for, plus all the other responsibilities you have. Remind yourself that you're doing a good job. You're doing the best that you can. Give yourself some grace also on areas you may have missed and encourage yourself to keep going, okay? As our uh, great little sign here says, the more reflective you are, the more effective you can be. So we wanna make sure to give ourselves the space for reflection in our caregiving journal. All right, guys, so we've looked at each of the four ways that we can create space to be a successful caregiver. And now I really want you to take a moment to uh, reflect, right? Um, and I want you to think about the four areas we've talked about. And in the chat, think about where do you think you need to do a better job in creating space? Is it in more self-care for yourself? 
and creating more joy, asking for help, or taking time to reflect. So I'll just ask you to put those words in the chat. Where do you see yourself needing a little more time and attention to one of these four ways? Barbara said, definitely self-care. I see a lot of self-care. Kay Marie asking for help. That is bold of you. Yes, asking for help. I saw a reflection in there, a couple of reflections. Thank you, Sarah, Melanie, Betsy, reflecting. <laughs> Linda said, all. Oh, I'm with you, Linda. <laughs> Joy, thank you, Kathy. A lot of times it is not fun, get it. So practicing and making time for joy is one that some of us may have to work on more than others. Awesome, keep them coming. I love all the responses. So that is your homework. Now I know you didn't come here to, to get homework, but I am gonna encourage you, whichever area, even if it's all four, that you said, you know what? I need to take some time to work on this. I challenge you to make note of what you've learned today in that specific area and start to put some action into place immediately, right? That's how you begin today to create this mindset uh, shift and to start to create space in your own life, okay? So the more you put it off, the harder it'll be. If you start today, write out some goals that you wanna do today, you can start to create that shift. Thank you guys for being honest there. So we mentioned before, and I think we said what, about uh, less than 10% were some of the lucky ones that currently in their life, they do not have any caregiver responsibilities. So for you folks, I do encourage you to help someone who may be overextended with their caregiver responsibilities. Now, no gesture is too small, and I'm not asking you to take over all of their duties, but there are simple ways that you can be a blessing to a caregiver who may desperately need it whether they ask for help or not. So here are just a few that are simple and easy ways that you can provide help. Make a meal. Everybody has to eat, right? Um, and so, you know, offering to maybe grocery shop or make a meal to bring over to the caregiver and the person they're caring for could be a huge help. Take over duties for a day. So give your caregiver the day off. Let them go get their massages or watch their movie or you know the Manny Petty, I saw those in the chat. Give them a day off so they can have that self-care. You have no idea how rejuvenating that could be uh, to a caregiver. Remind them of what's good. So I've seen people say, and we've said over and over that you know some days they, the days are hard and every day is not great. And so remind them what, what is good, right? Um, some things that are going well, the progress they have made. Along those lines, speak positively. So, you know, you, you, when people are going through stuff, you know, it's easy to kind of get caught up in what's wrong, what's not going right. Speak positive words to give them some encouragement. Here's the last one that's really important, and that is make space to listen. So being an engaged, active listener um, could be just as much of what someone needs than cooking them a meal, right? Maybe they just need to kind of let it out, get it off their, their heart, off their head, and maybe they just need someone to listen to. So offer up that time. I am curious, and I'm just going to ask you guys to add your thoughts in the chat as we continue to move along here. But if there's some other ways that um, you have experienced support or you think is another great example on how one how someone can support you as a caregiver put that in the chat again it's all about sharing let's think of some other ways that may be helpful again so we can learn from one another so continue to add those so this webinar today is only for an hour right but rest assured, there are year-round resources that are at your fingertips. So if you need more information throughout your caregiving journey, um, there are things that are here for you. So I absolutely have to start with our sponsor today, Mental Health America. So um, Jackie actually mentioned in the opening that they have a new toolkit this month for uh, new caregivers. So anyone that's new to this role, there are a ton of resources on the website. So I just popped in a few here 
that you can see. So we've talked about self-care and support. So there are, there are some additional resources there, but also other things if you need you know, advice around the legalities of caregiving or any other caregiving concerns, you can find a plethora of really good resources there. Um, the other thing I really love about the Mental Health America website is that throughout the year, they have links to a number of free assessments where caregivers can actually gauge their own mental health. So this could be a great resource to start your self-care journey today. There are a few more year-round resources that I really want you to take note of. And some of these may sound familiar to you. Um, and some of them may be things that you know about or brand new. So AARP is an organi organization that focuses on issues impacting those over the age of 50. So remember we said uh, many caregivers are actually over the age of 50. So this is a valuable resource for that population of caregivers. The Caregiving Action Network. So this is actually one of Mental Health America's partners, and they boast a variety of tools and resources for caregivers. One of my favorites is right on their homepage. They have these micro videos with real testimonies from real life caregivers, just sharing their insightful advice. So that is worth it just in itself. Autism Society. So this is one of those national organizations that's been around for over 50 years. Uh, they have a number of online resources. You can also locate some of their affiliates, which they have in almost all of the 50 states. So for uh, parents or care professionals or teachers who have um, um, caregiving responsibilities for kids with autism, this is an, a magnificent resource. Here's the last one. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but Wounded Warrior Project. So this uh, site offers great information and support, not only for the nation's wounded service members, but their families as well. So I would encourage you all, um, if you know of some great resources or some other organizations that support caregivers, feel free, please, please, please add them to the chat so we can make note of those as well. Caregivers, use all of these re resources provided to create your own support circle, something that is unique to you and your caregiving situation. So we mentioned earlier, you know, everyone doesn't have a ton of family members like, like me and some of us do have. Um, so you can create your own space, create your own circle of support. And some of these, these organizations could be good resources for just that. Okay, and I do see some, some stuff popping up here in the chat. So thank you guys for, for sharing and continue to do so. All right. So now for the fun part, before we open up for questions, I brought a couple of my journals that I published this year right in time for Mental Health Month. So the Stay Still journal is filled with creative assessment activities plus a plethora of journaling pages to help facilitate that reflection time that we've talked so much about in step number four. So I am so thankful that you all joined today. So I wanna reward your participation by giving away a couple of my journals. So again, they're a great tool um, to allow caregivers to set aside that time we talked about to assess and reflect, right? Ask yourself some questions, get those answers, but it also makes a thoughtful gift right in time for the holidays. So if you win, and we are, I'll talk about how you get to win today. If you win, you can start enjoying your journaling experience right now, today, or you can gift it to someone who may need it. This is a great gesture to show that you care about someone else's mental health. I do wanna mention that these gifts are courtesy of the Armstead Group and not Mental Health America. With that, I wanna pose two questions for a chance to win a journal. And it's really just in review of some stuff that we've talked about today. So hopefully you guys have been taking notes uh, and you have some information stored up that you're holding on to regarding what we've talked about today. Uh, but this is how it's gonna work. I am gonna pose two questions to find two winners. So the answer, uh, once, if you're able to put the answer, the correct answer in the chat, what we will do is for all those who get the correct answer, so not just any answer, it has to be the right answer. Uh, for all those who get the right answer, we're gonna do um, a raffle later and pick a winner out of all the correct answers. 
and then I'll be contacting you to let you know um, and get the journal over to you, okay? So again, all you have to do to win is be the one to put in the, the correct answer. So we'll give you about a minute or so so that you can get your answers in before we shut off for the second question, okay? So hopefully you're ready. Jackie and I are gonna man the chat. Here is the very first question. What does the acronym SPACE stand for in the term create space? All right, we've talked about this one. Hopefully there's some new, some, some notes in there. Heidi, I see seeking, but there are a little bit more to, to, to it, Heidi, than just seeking. <laughs> awesome, look at all these great, these great answers, these correct answers. Jackie, I'm so impressed. They were paying attention. Wow, this is awesome. This is the correct answer. Got it. All righty. So we will be doing the drawing to figure out which of you will get a journal. I see them still coming in. All right. We're going to pop over to our second question for a second chance to win a journal. And it is dun, 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 dun. how many Americans did we say? learn uh, that we learned today takes on the role of caregiver. I'll give you a hint. It was in the millions. It was a big number. I see some answers coming in. Someone did 53 million with all the zeros that they should win because I would have just written out the word or put an M. So <laughs> All right, I see a bunch of 53 million. You guys were, were paying attention. I am so impressed. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So again, you will hear from us uh, soon regarding the raffle winner for all those great answers. I am so glad that you guys got something from today. So with that, I do wanna thank you all for um, paying attention, participating. I truly hope that you got some good nuggets to take away um, and, and some good things. So as we turn it back over, to uh, Miss Jackie, we'll, we'll entertain some questions that may have come in, um, but I'll just leave you guys with this final thought. So our question was, who cares for the caregiver? Caregivers, you are responsible for taking care of yourself just as much and just as well as you take care of the ones that you love. So that is the answer to our question today. I am gonna stop sharing. Thank you guys. And Jackie, do we have any questions we can answer? Yeah, absolutely. Before we jump in, just thank you so much, Dr. Olmstead. I know I told you not to worry about checking the chat too often, but there has just been an outpouring of thank yous and support throughout your presentation today. So um, I can tell everyone's really appreciative, as am I. There were really so many great actionable pieces that we can take from today that anyone who's joining, whether they're a caregiver themselves, know someone who is a caregiver, might in the future become a caregiver, can take from um, yeah. your session today. So thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you. you. One of um, the questions that we did have come through that I'd love to um, respond before we end our time here today was from an attendee who um, said, I struggle with asking my sister for help with my mom because she has said no. Um, in the past, she has made excuses of why she can't help or if she isn't available. And because of that, she has less experience and doesn't know as well how to help my mom. So I feel like she won't do it the right way. How do I get over this? Great question, and thank you for providing some foundation and some uh, background about the situation. Um, so, you know, some people, you know, what we hear is she said, no, she doesn't want to help. But I wonder, sometimes people use that as an excuse to cover up some other things. So could be, um, maybe she does feel that she doesn't know the right way to do it, right? Um, and so she's hesitant and skeptical in that way. So if that could be the case, you know, maybe offering to have her come over and spend a day with you to help to see how things are going and how to do things the correct way. That will also help you to release some of that control. Um, and I know being a caregiver, sometimes we feel like 
you know, this is the right way. And sometimes certain things need to happen, you know, at a certain time, they may need to take medication, uh, different things like that. So maybe having that time and just offering instead of put, you know, come over and take care of mom for today, maybe you come over and together, you know, we'll do some of these things uh, as one. The other thing could be some people deal with, uh, especially a parent or a child and them being ill or needing care differently. So maybe her um, unwillingness to help could really be, you know, masking the fact that it's hard for her to see her mom in that condition. Um, and so I don't know the relationship with you and your sister, but maybe, you know, trying to think about those two different avenues and inviting her to a conversation around those and maybe giving her a chance to sit in with you um, so that she can, you know, see the dynamics and get to know how things are working. Hopefully that helps. And yeah, that's that's a tough situation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that insight. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of our hour and um, I didn't see any other specific questions come through. But one thing that I had made note of throughout your presentation um, that I just wanted to elevate at the end of our session here today is when you talked about um, joy and um, the importance of joy and practicing joy. And it brought me back to um, something that another old past colleague of mine used to talk about in the sense of hope and that hope mm -hmm. is an action. And it made me think of joy in the same way, that there's things we can do to help create that joy in our lives and in other people's lives. And there's things that we can do to provide hope for ourselves and for the people we're caring for. And I wanted to elevate one of the comments from the chat from a participant, Elena, who said, I have a gratitude jar. After a good day, I'll write down what happened on a sticky note with the date and put it in the jar. At the end of the year, I go through all of them. And I just loved that. And I think mm -hmm. it's such a great example of how we can make these feelings actionable so that we can be purposeful and intention, um, have that intention behind um, really trying to find that joy and that gratitude and um, that hope in times when caregiving is hard mm -hmm. and days can get long and it can be exhausting. Um, so I just loved, uh, wanted to elevate that comment from Elena. That's such a great idea. Um, and I know Dr. Um said you've given us so many other great examples too. Oh. That one is great, though. I love that. And I love what you said, that hope, joy, all those positive things are actionable. So when you can take them and actually see them or actually practice them every day, it becomes more real. So it sounds less freely and intangible joy. What is that? You can actually put it into action. So I love that. I'm so glad she shared that example. Exactly. Well, thank you. I know that um, we have a lot of questions in the chat about your journal. And for those of you that don't end up winning a raffle, again, just a reminder, I will be putting anyone who got the correct answer in a random um, name picker, and we will reach out to you, those of you that won. But if you are interested in the journal, we can definitely include the link to find that in your follow-up materials. Um, so if that's something that you think, and it is a great resource, like Dr. Armstrong had said, you know, journaling and just processing through our own thoughts can be a really great way to practice mm -hmm. coping. Um, and sometimes having a guide to do that is easier than just sitting down with a blank piece of paper. So um, I thank you, Dr. Armstrong, for your generosity in um, providing those journal raffles. And we can definitely include the information to find those and Dr. Olmsted's contact info in um, the follow-up materials so that you are able to find that and reach out to her if you have additional questions um, yes. or comments from today. So I just wanna give one last thank you to Dr. Armstead and thank you to all of you for joining us. Your participation has been wonderful. We are always so appreciative to have you here. And just a reminder that that follow-up will be sent out within one week. It'll include the recording, the slides from today. I know some of you are asking about those as well. Mm -hmm. The link to request your certificate of attendance and also um, the link to Dr. Armstead's resources. So just thank you, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and the rest of your week. And thank you, Dr. Armstead. Yes, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.